Hi guys, welcome to week four. This week we'll be covering chapters eight and nine, which is basically um, roots of administration. So GI or um, entero, and chapter nine covers everything else considered parentero. Uh, just a couple housekeeping notes right off the bat. Um, this week you have chapters eight and nine, homework and tests due on MindTap, the form for week four, as well as the part two of the drug project. If you have not submitted part one of your drug project, you still need to get that in as soon as possible. I do have a couple of you that are still hanging in the limb there. So, um, chapter eight, enteral or GI. This is the most common form of administration. Um, it's the, the reason it's the most common form is because it's actually really cost effective to make medications into tablets or capsules compared to putting them into injections or transdermal systems, etc. Um, it's safe because doses can be retrieved. If someone has just recently taken too much of a medication, they have methods to have that dose retrieved, whether it's through having them um, do charcoal administration and having the patient vomit or something of that nature. Um, it's also convenient. It's not painful to the patient at all. There's no injections involved. There's no technique involved. You simply put a capsule or tablet in your mouth and swallow it with a drink. Disadvantages of oral administration. Um, slower onset of action because it has to be broken down in the stomach and then absorbed, as well as it is subject to metabolism um, by the liver. So anything that goes to the stomach also gets metabolized in the liver once it's absorbed. Also, if a patient is nauseous or vomiting, you can't use the oral route of administration because otherwise the medication is just going to come right back up. In addition to if the patient is unconscious, you can't use that either. A lot of times patients will be what's called NPO or nothing by mouth before surgery or before a procedure, and that usually includes medications unless otherwise noted. So that might be a reason that is a disadvantage for oral medications as well. There's a couple extra parts to oral administration, um, nasogastric tubes or G-tubes um, are ways to bypass having the patient have to swallow if they're unable, unable to. Um, it's not very comfortable for the patient, which is a disadvantage. However, it still gets the medication down into the stomach where it needs to be. The G-tube is a direct route into the abdomen, um, usually inserted through the abdomen is a tube that goes right into the stomach and can be used if you have to administer um, nutrition or medications for a longer period of time instead of an NG tube to sort of avoid that discomfort. The last um, thing this chapter talks about is the rectal route of administration, which is still going through the GI tract, just of course at the other end. Um, it avoids the digestive enzymes and bypasses the problem that somebody might have with nausea and vomiting if they're unable to take oral medications. However, it's still subject to metabolism, so you still have that problem there. Um, the other disadvantage is there's not too many medications that are in suppository form. Um, a few of them, acetaminophen, aspirin suppositories, there are um, enemas for people who are constipated, so not a whole lot of options there for that route of administration. Also, it can be subject to a regular absorption, so you might give a dose, but you don't know how much of that dose got absorbed. In Chapter 8, there's lots of good guidelines for administrations and special considerations for each of the things I just talked about. A good idea would be to go over those and just kind of look at them, because it's going to become part of your daily life, whether you're administering them as yourself or assisting someone to administer them. So I won't be covering those in depth, strictly because it's really sort of a procedure thing. Um, you'll get more comfortable with it once you've done it a few times, but it's a good idea to have um, understanding of the basics. Chapter 9, parenteral, um, the most common being injection, but it also includes everything from eye and ear medications, transdermal medications, inhalers that go into the lungs. So it encompasses everything that people aren't um, in tablet or capsule form that people aren't swallowing. Um, there are two different effects that parenteral medications can have, systemic or local. Your systemic medications are going to be your ones that are absorbed right into the bloodstream and they're distributed to the body pretty quickly, whereas your local ones are more of your topical medications, um, topical skin medications, eye and ear medications, etc. So again, this is going to be a pretty quick little lecture on this because a lot of this talks about administration and um, special considerations with each route. So I would pay attention to those patient education tablets, um, or like the, they're the ones that are in chapter nine, the little sidebars there, because that's basically patient education is also nurse education, because the patient won't always be the one taking the medication. You might be the one giving it to them. 
So they cover sublingual and buccal. Sublingual is under the tongue, buccal is tucked back behind, between the gum and the cheek. Um, they're both pretty absorbed pretty rapidly. You have a lot of blood vessels right under your tongue there. So the medication basically disintegrates and gets right into the bloodstream, bypasses any of those GI issues we talked about, such as absorption or metabolism, and is basically available right away. Um, an example of that would be nitroglycerin. A lot of you might have heard of um, sublingual nitroglycerin used in a case where somebody thinks they might be having a heart attack. And that way the medication is available instantaneously. They don't even have to wait to have a little bit of relief. Um, the next thing they talk about is transdermal, and those are patches that have medication in them that sit on the skin, and those get absorbed right into the bloodstream as well. A little slower, you can kind of control the rate of absorption based on how the patch is made. Um, however, it still gets, the idea is to still get a systemic amount of um, drug level in the blood. Some examples of that, a lot of you are familiar with fentanyl patches, which are pain patches that a patient will put on for three days and then change out. Um, also estrogen patches, there's patches for nausea and vomiting, and so a couple different options there. The next one they cover is inhalation medications. This is a pretty big, um, usually, it's a pretty big category of drugs, usually covers asthma-related medications, but there's a ton of inhalers out there or nebulizers. The book goes into depth on each of those, make sure you understand the difference between um, what an inhaler is versus what a nebulizer is. Inhalers are what we call puffers. Um, there's even within it puffers, there's a bunch of different options there, but um, the idea is to get the medication into the lungs in an aerosolized form. And it's pretty convenient because the patient just has to press down and breathe in. However, there is some technique to it. So it can be difficult in that manner. If they don't have good technique, then they're not getting the dose they need. Um, nebulizers are liquid medications that go in a special machine and it aerosol aerosolizes the medication so the patient breathes in through a mask or through a little pipe. Um, again, there's no technique involved in that one, but it does require um, some equipment, so that could be a disadvantage there. Last but not least, um, a huge section is injections. I would review the different parts of a needle, as well as the difference between intradermal, sub-Q, and intramuscular injections. Um, those are going to make up the bulk of your injections. Anything that's in an IV line is getting pushed right through a line that already exists. The other ones actually do require some technique. Um, as well as understanding of sub-Q is just under the skin, intramuscular is deeper into a muscle. So again, I'm not going into depth on it in this lecture, strictly because a lot of it is just kind of, well, as you're reading, putting yourself in, like say, a nurse's shoes and imagining yourself going through those different steps. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to go contact me as always. Um, hope you guys have a great week and I will be posting midterm grades hopefully on Sunday for everyone that is caught up and where they need to be. Thank you guys. Have a great week.